Hi there, everybody. My name is Doug Bauman, and I'm live from just outside Kitchener, Ontario, between Kitchener and London at Syngenta's Honeywood Research Facility. And we're talking today about plant science and why the heck we're doing plant science when it's white as snow out there. And the answer is that plant science happens 12 months of the year. So to get us warmed up, I'm going to tell you a tiny bit about myself and a little bit about why plant science matters. We're going to go for a little spin around the farm here, and then we're going to meet my colleague, Ashley. Ashley's working in the laboratory, which, which we'll see. So to get warmed up, everything that humanity uses is either grown or mined. And if you think about that question for 30 seconds or 30 minutes, you're going to realize that it's right. Everything in your backpack, everything on your uh, desk, everything in your lunch, uh, the roof above your head was either grown or mined. And we're talking today about plant science. If I did a poll, if I did a, a quiz, if I did a survey monkey, you would know we're talking about what's grown. So when I think about what my own kids have learned in school, what they've learned is that plants need light, air, water, and nutrients to grow. They need those four things. And that is 100% true. And there's a part of plant science that looks at those four basics. The part that I'm going to talk about today is where plant science intersects with how we protect what plants do. So those four things we need are what helps a plant grow from a seed to a grown plant, goes from a seed to a kernel of wheat or a cob of corn, but protecting what the plant wants to do when we're talking about farming is really, really important because Mother Nature has a whole host of other organisms out there that really are trying to eat our lunch before we do. And those organisms you might think about uh, in your own backyard. So normally when I'm in a classroom, I would just shout out, you know, who protects their plants in their backyard? And people say, I do. I protect them from slugs. Gross. I protect them from squirrels who eat my strawberries. I protect them from weeds who shade my plants. And those things that we do in our gardens are the same things that we do in a farmer's field, except we have to do them bigger, we have to do them on a larger scale, and we certainly can't do them in as, as a manual way, using our hands and our muscles the way we would at, uh, the way we would at home. So in a minute, I'm gonna go around the building here, I'm looking off to the side, and we're gonna see just how big this farm is. And when I say we can't protect plants um, in, in farming and in agriculture the way you do at home, you'll get an idea. Because the farm that I'm on right now was founded around 1890, so about 130 years ago. And at that time, farms in Ontario were around 100 acres in size. 100 acres is 40 hectares. And the reason they were that size is because a family of 11, two parents, and nine children could weed all of the crops in that 100 acres in a week. So while you're not in school, you're weeding the corn, you're weeding the wheat, and at the end of that week, you would start over again at the beginning, right? So that's like painting a shed, and you, by the time you finish painting the shed, you have to start over again. It's crazy. So in modern worlds, we use chemistry, we use technology in order to make taking care of the crops easier and that does two things the first is that it helps us grow much more from the same land because we don't want to cut down forests for farmland we've cut down enough already quite frankly humanity has already done that we've had to clear land to grow food but now that we have the land let's keep the forests that we have and grow more food on the same amount of land so that's the one thing that modern technology lets us do and then the second thing that it lets us do is grow our food more efficiently, which makes it a little bit less expensive at the, the grocery store. And that's really important. I don't know if you've heard your parents nowadays complain about how expensive food is. 
Uh, that's true. And part of the reason it's expensive now is because farmers have done a really great job of making it affordable for so many years. So let's talk now a bit. And I'm going to walk while we talk. And I'm really sorry if you get a bit of a wind. But as much as I feel for you, you should feel for me. I'm standing out here in the winter for crying out loud, right? It's freezing. Let's go for a walk. So farmers have to worry about weeds. Weeds steal sunlight from your crop. Weeds steal nutrients from your crop. Weeds steal space from your crop. And what's crazy, if you think about dandelions, you have dandelions in your yard? I know I do. Dandelions are maybe what? 20 centimeters tall? In a farmer's field, dandelions can be about three and a half feet tall. You know, you're like almost half the height of a basketball player is how high dandel how tall dandelions can be. That's crazy. No wonder farmers don't want weeds in their fields. Fungus. Fungus. Like mushrooms, right? The mushrooms that we eat are part of the genera fungi. And fungus have a, make a great habit of attacking plants. They will attack the plant, they'll kill the plant, and of course they'll contaminate the food that we eat. Because fungus leave behind toxins in our food that makes it dangerous for animals and sometimes dangerous for people to eat that food. All right, crazy. Here, again with the wind, I'm so sorry, but hopefully my big loud voice will power over that. Look at this. Look at this snowdrift. I'm going to try and lift up way high for you. So all the land you see behind me is a research farm, right? Frozen in the winter. I get it. But all of this area that you see, we use to conduct experiments in the summer on how to help farmers protect their crop from weeds, fungus. And the last one I didn't mention, bugs, insects. Insects love to eat our crops. Anyone ever seen a strawberry where it's got a, an earwig buried inside of it? You haven't seen it at the grocery store because farmers have done their job, but you definitely do see it at home. Or at least I see it at home because I'm not a great farmer. I'm actually a chemist by training. So here we are. And I, when I think about, I'm going to step away from that air compressor. I want to talk for a second here about, about science. So we're just outside Kitchener, Waterloo, Cambridge, Ontario, middle of winter, talking plant science. I want you to know who is in these laboratories that you see behind me. You see those labs? There's 700 square meters of laboratories here. Compare that to your school science classroom. We have on site chemists, chemical engineers, pathologists, entomologists, weed scientists, and a number of other folks, molecular biologists, all types of science being represented at this site in Ontario. That's really cool, right? When you think you talk to your guidance counselor and you say, where am I going to go to get a job? What am I going to do when I go to university? Make sure you know that all sorts of really cool careers are happening in small towns in Ontario. And you can do these cool jobs, such as you're going to see in about 10 seconds. You can do these cool jobs. So I'm going to introduce you to Joey. See my, my colleague Joey here in the background? He's going to take control here now, and you're going to meet Ashley as well. Joey, all yours. Hey, folks. My name is Joey Soblich, and I, too, am with Syngenta Canada. I work in our marketing department, so it's my job to really help spread the word to farmers and the wider public about all the work that goes on here and why our products are beneficial. Uh, mainly, my job involves, talk involves talking to farmers, so that's in a lot of different ways. That's in advertisements you might see in a magazine or a newspaper, uh, radio ads, sometimes even TV, which is kind of fun. But right now I'm going to introduce you to one of the most important people at this farm to our business. Her name is Ashley. She is a plant pathologist. So she's going to explain to you in just a second what, what, what exactly a plant pathologist does. I'm just going to flip around the camera so you don't have to see my mug anymore. We're just going to flip it around. 
There we go. And you should see. Whoop. There we go. Sorry, sorry, sorry. There we go. Okay. Ashley, how's it going? Can you, can, oh, I'm doing all right. Can, can you tell us what what is a plant pathologist? Well, a lot of people don't know this, but plants get sick just like you and me. Only with humans, we get sick a lot with viruses and bacteria. But plants, although they do get sick by that viruses and bacteria, they also get really sick with fungi. So I'm actually a fungal fungi, think mushroom different kinds. Uh, fungal plant pathologist. Pathology means studying of diseases. So fungi, viruses, bacteria, they cause diseases in plants. And this is a problem because we eat plants. In fact, we eat a lot of plants. Pretty sure Doug already talked about um, how important plants are to you, people and society. So I try to find out what fungi are the are the problems in our crops and then I help our company test our products to protect plants from the fungi that hurt our crops and I also do some I, I also help some growers and customers when they have problems in their fields and they can't figure out what fungi are killing their crops they send their plants to me and I try to figure out what's the problem with fungi and then how can we help them protect their crops so the first thing I'm going to do is show you around my lab. This is what we call our potting area. I actually have quite a few things set out for everybody to look at in a little bit. But then, so I can test things all year long, it's important that I can grow things even when it's cold outside. Okay. that live in the soil that kill pea plants. So these are little, well, the one pot where you can actually see green, those are peas that are getting grown in a pot that has no fungi in the soil, no diseases in the soil. The one next to it, we put some fungi in there that we actually first found in a grower's field and we're testing to see what it does to these peas. So if you come this way, going to put on gloves real quick. So this is something we do all the time. We grow plants all year long in, what we, in that room. It's called our growth room or a controlled environment because we can make it as hot or cold as we want. We can control how much water goes into the pots because some diseases like to be dry, some diseases like to be wet in order to infect the plant. And then we see what happens. So those little guys there are sick little pea plants. So the fungi, these are planted at the very same time and it's the very same seeds. It's the very same soil. The only difference is that there's fungi in the soil. So you can see the difference there. And I'm doing a terrible job in real time pulling these out. So I actually cheated a bit and I did this earlier. And here you can see two pots that we fully harvested. And you can see how big the peas are that had the fungus in the soil. You can see some places where it's brown and kind of, and then you rot it. So that would be the same as when you pull up an apple or something out of your refrigerator that's kind of gone soft and it smells bad then you can you know that you, you've got something that's hurting that that plant because an apple is actually the fruit of uh, a tree and it's all plant life and then here's what you have where there's no fungus so if you're a grower and you're planting these seeds and really growers harvest their whole income in one shot and that's what they have to use to pay for their house their food their family everything so they want to make sure they can get the biggest harvest possible, not just to make sure people can eat, 
but to make sure that they can pay their bills. So you would definitely, if you're trying to pay your bills with your with plants, you'd want big, healthy plants, not tiny, not tiny plants. Those aren't going to give you a lot of seeds. Something else that we do here is we actually test different compounds, so different chemicals to see how do they stop fungi from growing. So here's what our fun, here's what one of the fungi that we work with looks like on a plate. So what happened here was a plant came in, we took the fungi off the plant, we do that in the lab, and then we put it on all sorts of different plates. So we have chemical in these plates to see does it stop the growth of the fungus? And if it does, we know that this is something we could maybe test in the field. So I'm actually gonna very quickly introduce you to my two friends that work in my lab. Because we don't do a lot, of, we do all the that potting out here, but we actually have a lab that we work in. So those are my two colleagues, and that's what a, a plant pathology lab looks like. All those boxes are full of the different fungi that we work with. We long-term them. We've got living stuff we can see in a lab, microscopes. But basically, a lot, a lot of fungi and people working hard. Thanks, Zach and Kendra. I wanted to show you something about, so we looked at a fungus that kills plants that's already in the soil, but sometimes fungus gets onto the head of a plant. So think of wheat, and if you haven't seen wheat before, it looks a lot like grass. So if you forget to cut your grass for a little while, you get the a head on it. That's, it looks a lot like a wheat head. Grower harvests that wheat head, and they get wheat. And that looks pretty good to me. Maybe that one looks a little funky, but if somebody said, can you eat that? I'd say, you bet. The problem is fungus can be sneaky sometimes and it gets into the head where we can't see it. So what we do sometimes is we'll take, so this is, I took this seed and I put it on a plate that has special agar in it. So agar, just think of agar as fungus jello. That's all it is. It's a jello that feeds the, helps feeds the fungus. And then we get these little white colonies. That's kind of what, that's what fungus looks like growing on a, on a seed. And it kind of looks like fluffy hair. So from there, we'll clean that up. So we just have one bit of it. And then I have to make sure it is what it's supposed to be. So this is supposed to be, I can look at this and say, I'm pretty sure this is fusarium. And this is what a fusarium spore looks like. So what I did, well not me actually, my friend Zach, he made a slide of that. And you can see this is, we've taken our, what we see on the microscope, and we put it up on the TV so that you can see what's there. And in the middle, see that thing that looks like a boat? That's a fusarium spore. And under a microscope, that's what all that fluffy stuff looks like. It still kind of looks like hair. But it's long tubes of cells, and that's the fungus's body. It's called mycelium. It's kind of a long, boring word, but that's, that's what it's called. It's called mycelium. So we will double check that that fungus is what it is. And this is a problem for two reasons. Fusarium on a seed will make it that it will make the seed sick and it won't grow very big or it might outright kill it. But fusarium, when you use that meat to make bread, it actually has it makes a, a poison and that makes us sick. So fusarium is really bad for two reasons: it makes us sick and and other animals like horses, pigs especially. When pigs eat, eat fusarium, they get really really sick. And then it also hurts plants. So what we do is we test products and we help develop products that you put on the seed. And this will help those seeds that have the fusarium 
in them grow to be big. Now, I didn't have any of those on me, but Joey mentioned how we show people what we do. And this is actually an advertisement we made. We all work together to do this sort of thing, to tell people about our products, but we have an untreated product. And then, so I'm un, sorry, untreated seeds, but with fusarium. And then we have what the plant looks like when we use our treatment. And as you can imagine, it's just a very small amount of, of plant medicine, basically, these chemicals that we're making are plant medicine. They're protecting that plant from all these diseases that are out there. It's a very small amount on the seed, but it makes a huge difference to that plant and to the grower. I've got a question coming in, actually. Oh. How does a fungus form? How hard is the job of a plant pathologist? So oh. it's a two-parter for you from a grade three and four class in Sarnia. Okay. Well, I'm going to answer the second question first. So I love my job. I love plants. I love fungi. And I love the way they kind of work together. So as far as I'm concerned, being a plant pathologist isn't hard because I love what I do. If you like plants and fungi and science and microscopes and taking measurements and solving problems, then this job isn't hard at all. I did have to go to university and I did have to study with somebody who also was a plant pathologist so he could show me how to do my job. But other than that, I find it um, not, I find it, it's great. It's great. I think if you love what you're doing, it's never hard. Now, where do fungi come from? They're like you and me. They're everywhere. Right now, in the room you're in, there's probably hundreds, if not millions, of fungal spores in the way, in the air. There's fungi that um, live off of live material, dead material. They live off of, um, they, they are on plants, on people. You can get, people can get um, fungi growing on them. But really, fungi are so, so important because they help decompose all the plant life in our in our world. So imagine you are a weed, or um, even yeah, like say a weed in a in a field, and you have died over the winter. If that plant material, that dead brown material that you'll see if you run through a field in the in the spring, if fungi didn't eat that and put it back into the ground, we would all be living in kilometers and kilometers of dead plant material, right? So they are actually incredibly important members of, the, of all the kingdoms. They're very beneficial in a lot of ways. We just try to keep them away from the crops we're trying to eat because we have to make sure everybody has enough food to eat. Is that good? Okay. Thanks. Thanks for the question, Paula. So I also, what else? Um, oh, I'm going to show another fungus. So this is a different idea. So this is rye seed. So I don't know if you've had rye bread before. That's regular rye seed. So this fungus is a little bit different. It gets into a rye plant into when it flowers because grasses flower too. Their flowers are just not as pretty as some of the ones you might have in your garden. So the fungus gets into the flower and it takes over the entire piece of that rye plant that was gonna make a seed and it makes its own body so that's called a sclerotia it's and this if you were to talk to somebody and you wanted to sound really smart you could say this was ergot of rye so these are purple bodies and if any of you guys ever have a chance to open up a bag of rye seed you can almost always find a few of these in there that's actually where i found most of them the problem with these is that they're very poisonous to all mammals, so especially humans. So what they do, if you eat too, if you have too much of this in your bread, because it looks a lot like rye, except for the purple, but if you weren't paying attention and you made bread, you ground this up with the rye and you made bread with it, you eat it, and what it does is it stops the blood from going out to your fingers and your toes. And that gives you something that they used to call St. Anthony's fire because they didn't know what was causing it, but it was actually these ergots in their rye. Fungi are just like anything else on the planet. They want to make more of themselves and they want to make sure that they make on, they, be, they survive to the next generation. 
this fungus is very cool. It's called sclerotinia. And here you can see it on some plants. But why I really like it is it can, it can, it can uh, infect or eat 400 different types of plants. And it looks different depending on what it's been eating. So this is from soybeans. So we've got this off of a soybean plant and they just like look like little black balls. And what that is, it's the fungus. And it's made this black protective layer so that it can wait in the soil until it, until a crop is planted that it can eat. And then those will germinate, produce spores and attack the plant. But these, this is super cool. And if you were here, I'd ask you guys all this question, but this is the same disease, same fungus, different plant. This is the sclerotia it made on sunflowers. You can kind of see this, you can kind of see the pattern that you might see in a sunflower head. And somebody brought these to me to show me because they knew I would be, I would think it was super cool. And this is just from two sunflower plants plants. So all this goes back into the soil and it waits till next year so it can infect the next round of plants. So I'm going to skip to, I'm going to start talking about insects a bit. Now I'm not an insect specialist. Uh, that's an entomologist. They study insects, but I've got all my friends at Syngenta who study insects and do field work with insects trying to protect our crops from them. And they sent me some pretty cool pictures, so I'm going to show them to you. Okay, so these are wire worms. And I think when you look at the picture, you can kind of figure out why. So we'll focus on this picture. This wire worm is attacking a wheat plant. And what it does is it burrows right through the bottom of that plant and it'll kill it right out, outright. So where a grower thinks he's going to have a big plant that will produce lots of grain, now he doesn't. But what's very important is that we do make all these products to protect plants, but we want to make sure that the pest is there in the first place, because if the pest is, isn't there, we shouldn't use our products. So Syngenta did a big project with some researchers at universities, and they did this bait, this is called a bait ball. And that's just oatmeal and a couple other things that attract the wire worms. So growers could put this in their field, see if the bait ball attracted wire worms and if they were there they knew that they had to protect their crop against the pest and if they weren't they knew that they were okay these are called aphids and i don't know if you've seen these in your home garden but what they do is they have a stylet they have like a like a long straw that sticks out of their mouth and they pop it into the plant and then they suck all the sugars that the plant makes out of the actual plant which you think that's not so bad, especially if you look at what a fungus does. A fungus just destroys the plant. But if all of the sugar is going into the aphid, it's not going into the plant, and eventually that plant will die. This is a cucumber beetle. And one of my friends at work, this is from a trial she was doing. So a trial is just a test where you set some you set something up where you're testing different products to see does this help the grower or does it not help the grower does it control this beetle or does it not and as you can see this beetle has almost and its friends i'm sure there's lots of beetles in this cucumber field has almost eaten that entire leaf again if that cucumber plant gets to produce cucumbers later there won't be very many of them because that leaf is what takes the sun's energy and makes it into cucumbers. And if it does, or it, or it dies, or the plant just dies. Um, I wanted to talk very quickly about beneficial insects. So as part of our job at Syngenta, we know that pollinators like bees are very, very important. And we have two things, two big things that we've done to make that happen or to support pollinators. So all the research farms that Syngenta has in Canada, they have, and other 
and we've actually set up quite a few other of these um, at golf courses and at our offices. It's called Operation Pollinator. So this is sections of land that we have con converted to have wildflowers that produce lots of food for beneficial insects. And actually, the ones that we have here at our research farm, we have active honeybees. And last year, I got to help take care of those bees and harvest the honey. And this year, I get to take a beekeeping course so I can help take care of them too. So this is another beneficial insect. It's a two-spotted stink bug, and it's actually eating the eggs of an insect that eats potatoes. It's called the Colorado potato beetle. And I actually have a picture of one of those beetles. So that's, that's going to eat a potato plant. And I've actually looked at trials or tests uh, looking at Colorado potato beetles where the entire plant, like the entire section that we didn't use any of our products on, there was no plants there. It was just all kind of spindly potato skeletons. And the last one, it's super, super cool. So this is an, a cabbage worm. So that'll eat your cabbage plants. And actually this worm is doing a pretty good job of it right now. But this beneficial is a parasitoid wasp. So it's a wasp that's a parasite. And what a parasite does is it hijacks something else and it puts itself in it. So that's what it's done. That's all the wasps eggs that have been laid inside of this cabbage worm and the cabbage worm is obviously not going to do anything else but um so it's the the wasp has now taken care of that worm so we're also very um focused here about making sure that our products get to the get to the insects that are eating the plant like that and they're not hurting some of these beneficials that i just showed so that is most of what I had to share with you today. Is there anything else anybody has a question of before they leave me? A question just popped in. How do we know these fungi aren't in our bread that we buy at the grocery store? Oh. Question from Bree. Okay, that's a great question. So when a, a farmer or a grower harvests their wheat before it goes into, um, before it goes to the places that make bread, there is an in-between stop and they test the grain for the toxin or the poison that this fungus makes. And if so long as the, the poison doesn't show up in the grain sample, then it's able to go into the grain bins, the big grain bins at these places that test, and then it goes to the bread company. So, the government of Canada, and there's um, lots of different divisions, they make sure that none of these things get into our food system. The problem is that grower, if he, if he didn't protect his wheat, now he doesn't have anything to pay his, his mortgage with, right? So he has to make sure that his wheat doesn't have that poison in it so that he can sell it and it, and it doesn't get turned down. Thanks for the question, Bree. Any other questions for Ashley or Doug? Oh, here we go. Question from Jordan. What sorts of subjects and classes should a student focus on in high school and university if they want to have a career working in plant science? Well, I took um, all my biologies, chemistries, math in high school. Those ones were the most important. And then in university, I actually did a plant a plant biology, so a botany undergraduate course, they call it. So my first four years at university were in botany, so just studying plants. And then I did my master's degree in plant pathology, exactly what you're seeing now. So then I, I focused on just plant diseases. And I'll let you get in. And then for me, I took all the maths and all the sciences in high school because I didn't know what I wanted to do when I was older. And then over time, I got a little bit narrower. So I went to university for four years, and I studied chemical engineering and chemistry. And then I went to university for another six years for chemical engineering. And 
all that means is understanding uh, how does energy, how does matter flow, how do we transform it into useful products. Uh, and despite the fact that chemistry is what I love and where I started my career, I get to work in a plant science uh, in a plant science company, which is super cool. Caleb is asking, what is the most common kind of fungi you guys get? Um, that's a toughie because we actually get all sorts of different fungi, but they all belong to, most of them belong to one kingdom. Now, um, so they're a little bit different than the mushrooms that you buy at the grocery store because those, those are fungi too. But I'd say that for us, we do a lot of work with Pizarium. So that's the one that makes that poison, that mycotoxin, because that one's a really important one to make sure that we protect things from. There's one called Rhizoctonia and Pythium. And those ones are pretty bad because they attack again that seed. And if you can't protect the seed, then your plant has no hope. Never mind the insects, if it doesn't even produce leaves. So those are the three that I do quite a lot of work with, but we work with all sorts of diseases from across um, the country, and we have actually over 1,000 different fungi that we store on site that we do work research with. Nice. Thanks for the question, Caleb. I think we're just about at the end of the school day, aren't we, Joey? I, I believe so. I mean, at least back in my day. Well, thanks for joining folks. Ashley and I are really happy to bring you around Syngenta's Honeywood Research Farm from sunny Platteville, Ontario. And that'll be very true when that cloud that I see out there just moves on past. So well, hopefully we'll see you around here when the sun is shining and it's green outside. Thank you.